Wow, what a big screen. It's great to have all this real estate to play with. Um, some of our, uh, we, uh, we took the challenge with our graphics department to really uh, use this format. Let's see how you guys like it. Um, my name is Michael Henry. Uh, I'm a, a partner with KPMG in New York City. I have been working for uh, more than 25 years in the financial services industry and uh, with banks, insurance companies, capital markets clients. Uh, within KPMG, we're, we have a pretty strong brand. Most of you probably know who KPMG is. We have a pretty strong brand in regulatory compliance, regulatory reporting, risk management, operational credit risk, things like that. And what, uh, within KPMG, like many of our competitors, a lot of our value proposition has been based around having the expertise to help our clients solve some of these problems and then forming teams, sometimes very large teams, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to help clients get things done. And we, we looked at the sector and we thought, you know, we need to be really thinking about what does the future hold for compliance regulatory reporting related functions. And when, I'll show you some examples. For those of you who work outside of financial services, uh, it, it may be a surprise to you how much of the work is manual with all of the associated problems of doing manual work. And so what we did is we decided that we needed to differentiate ourselves and be part of helping our clients change to what we see as the future state. And we've, we've, we've uh, coined a term we call digital labor. Uh, digital labor for us is a set of technologies that's, that's fairly diverse, all fairly modern. So it would, it would include robotic process automation or RPA, uh, big data, uh, cognitive, machine learning, uh, natural language processing, things that uh, are very well suited to solving problems in compliance. So uh, what, I'll, what we did is we created a solution to automate many compliance functions, and I'll show you uh, several use cases here, that removes the manual processing. And as I go through this, I hope you can see that any organization that has large numbers of human beings doing these sort of functions, the, the writing here is on the wall, and, and we're happy to be uh, uh, taking the lead on this and very happy to have won that Computer World Award last year. All right. Uh, you, usually, if, uh, if the audience um, is financial services, I usually don't have to spend too much time on this, but for, for a general audience, how many of you in the last 10 years have gotten a mortgage from a bank? All right, keep your hand up if that was a pleasant experience for you to work with your bank to get the mortgage. Anybody? One. Okay, great. <laughs> I, uh, I bought an apartment uh, in New York last year, and I, the uh, financing was cheap, and I, mortgaged, and I got a mortgage. And I went to the bank that I've been banking with since I was in college. Figured that would be easy. And I went to them, and, I, and so I filled out the online application, and they sent me back something and said, well, Mr. Henry, here is a long list of documents that you need to provide, and let's start with your last three-month bank statements. <laughs> and we're really curious how much money you make. So can you provide us that? And, and, oh, you're my bank. So that, that, our mortgage, and the mortgage side is a very highly regulated business. It's one of, the, uh, one of the use cases that we address. But it's the same for corporate, commercial, wealth management, uh, there's, a, there's, there's simply a lot of documentary evidence that the bank needs to collect, needs to read and scan and analyze, assign a risk rating, perform at some level of due diligence. And you know, the, uh, I worked with one client where it's a, um, a, pr a prime broker, and they called us in because from the time the salesperson closed deal with the client. In other words, the client has selected us as their prime broker, they're ready to go, we're going to start getting transactions, handshake has been done, to the time that the first transaction came in, the average time was 11 months. And in co the commercial banking space, the abandonment rate, in other words, sales that are closed but then the, the, trans the transactions never come at all, is greater than 20%. And a lot of that is due to the fact that this process is so, is so onerous. And because there's so much manual work, and the manual work consists of people reading things and applying policy to them, uh, it, it's, quite, it's quite error prone. 
Um, the, um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll get into a, a specific case in a second. Um, there are, uh, and yet, if the bank gets it wrong, the, the, the price is quite high. If the bank performs due diligence in a way that the regulators find insufficient for whatever reason, banks can have billions of dollars in fines, and we saw that during the, the keynote yesterday. So uh, I'll give you another example. Um, there's a, uh, a broker-dealer. Uh, I, was, I was talking to them, and they, are, um, they have a, a regulator breathing down their neck. They want to understand how some transactions got, got done and whether there was some improper behavior. And um, they were, they've hired 50 or 60 contractors to come in and just review transactions. Reading, some, some of the data are in systems, which is great, and some of the data are locked up in, I used to call them data prisons, now I've, I've converted to calling them data gulags, which are documents. And so what this broker-dealer is doing is saying, well, you know what, it's going to be so expensive for us to do this review, even if, even if we're innocent, it's so expensive for us to just comply, we may as well settle. So it's an enormous cost for the bank. And the, the things that people are doing is they're spending a lot of time transcribing data from documents or from systems, merging them together, and trying to apply some reasoning to those data. So naturally, given, given I'm sure what we've heard the last couple of days, we built a solution around Mark Logic to automate that process. So, let me take an example. There's a, a body of regulation called Know Your Customer. If uh, you as, a, as an individual, you as a, uh, uh, a company, you as a corporate, uh, go to a bank and establish a relationship, the bank has a duty to collect information that validates you are who you say you are. And they also have a duty to perform some level of due diligence on you to make sure you're not a bad guy to make sure that you are not involved in activities which are contrary to the interest of, of, the, of, of the government, the regulator, the country, to the world. You're not involved in, in money laundering. You're not, uh, you're not a terrorist. Uh, you're not involved in cyber crimes. You're not bankrupt. There's a lot, and, and, mo and most of this information is collected in documents. When you, when, you, when you did your mortgage application, you sent a lot of documents, and people, somebody in the bank, had to read those documents and make, and make evaluation on it. So in this a typical example is that the bank is already having trouble keeping up with the backlog and customer service or the customer experience is declining because it takes so long to get on board. Because it's all manual, it's really hard to figure out where things are. When I got a mortgage, I would call the bank and say, hey, what's going on? The bank was, was really clueless in telling me where my, where my application was. And so what tends to happen is, okay, we've got to get a lot of people and more and more people and we've got to train the people. Uh, and uh, I'm going to tell you a story here about the type of work that's being done. If, you're, you're, if your work consists of reading documents and transcribing them, uh, I, have a, I have a daughter named Allison. She spent one summer internship uh, working at a bank in New York. And her job was to look up values in a system, copy them, paste them into an Excel spreadsheet. And she had to do this all day long and she would come home and cry herself to sleep every night because it's a, a terrible job. And that, uh, that turned her off of banking completely. She now works for MTV. Uh, but, so it's, but it's a terrible, it's a, we're really turning, turning people into robots, especially for this sort of activity. The actual times when you find problems is fairly small. So most of this, you're really just kind of checking the box. And you know, the, the, way, the way people have typically solved the problem, OK, we can put in some workflow, so at least we can queue the work and send it around to different people. We can escalate things. We, can, we, can, we have document management systems that can put a document on a screen so people can swivel chair and type things in. And of course, one of the solutions is to move work to low-cost centers. So here's a, here's a function in a bank where getting it wrong could cost you billions of dollars. One of my clients, they lost their ability to clear U.S. dollars for a year. So they had to clear U.S. dollars through the competitor banks. Can you imagine that? And that duty is falling on the shoulders of some $11 an hour file clerk eight time zones away that you hired in February.
So here's, here's a typical uh, diversified financial uh, institution. You've got these poor, uh, in the center here, you've got the poor uh, compliance and tax people trying to establish policy, trying to, get, trying to apply rules. You've got the poor client up there on the upper left who's being, uh, who let's say, uh, I'm working with a commercial bank now, uh, a client of the commercial bank that maybe has uh, cash management or factoring or uh, other products like that and wants to open a, a line of credit. That's great. We'd love to sell you another product. Let me direct you to that product system person or that product owner who will then start the KYC process. And guess what? Uh, you're going to be asked for the same documentation that you had to produce when you first joined the bank. It's just like my experience with mortgage, it didn't help me to be a customer of the bank. So you have a lot of data living in silos. And, and the, the, the client I'm thinking of, they have even different technology systems, different document management systems in different parts of the bank. And, and can you imagine banks that have grown through acquisition and all the, the technology debt they've accumulated? And of course, one of the main ways they solve the problem is over here on the right side, somewhere, either onshore or offshore, or both, there is a BPO center with hundreds and hundreds of people that are taking these documents and reading them and trying to apply the policy. Well, future, so, and, and here I have three to five months, the, the, that bad case of 11 months I told you about before is, is, is absolutely not atypical, is, is fairly typical. Well, what, what if we could automate the reading and transcribing of these data from the documents. So, of course, forms are easy. Anyone can, can transcribe a form. OC, you can OCR things. But what if we can read and interpret and obtain the relevant know your customer data by machine? And what if we could then apply the rules, the compliance rules, most banks will have a global minimum standard that everyone has to follow, and then they'll have overlays. If you're a hedge fund, you may have this additional um, uplift. If you are in this part of the world, you may have this additional uplift. If you're this size of company, you may have this additional uplift. But what if, what if we could standardize that set of rules and automate the application of the rules? So instead of my $11 an hour file clerk reading the documents and trying to figure out you know, what, what, what additional documentation, how much due diligence do I need to perform? What if that could be done by machine? And so that's what we did. We've built a platform based around MarkLogic that does, it does many things, but the main gain is that it can, one, read and extract information that normally human beings were expected to do. And second, it can apply policies to determine compliance, appropriate identification, level of due diligence uh, for the customer. And then, the, and think about it from, a, from a, a, a compliance perspective, if I can do that, if an event happens and uh, I want to change my compliance policies, this is, a, this is a very difficult problem for banks. If I have operation centers with hundreds and hundreds of people in different parts of the world, and I decide I want to make a change in, in, uh, in the way, in, in some, some, some data I need to extract from a document, I've got to write a memo and issue it out to all those operation centers, and then the, the manager of the operation center will get it, and then they'll send out an email to all the, the operators, and we hope at some point people will start complying and following the rule. If the rules are automated, that problem becomes much simpler. And then, of course, having the one operational data store so I know what information I have on my client at any given time is an enormous benefit to the customer experience. I, I don't want my bank to ask me for something that I, gave, that I gave them six months ago. All right. So let's, let's talk about results here. So, we worked with a, a major global bank in their commercial banking group. And this is one of the initial proof of co proofs of concept that we did for them. And we showed them, you know, most, most, of, uh, most of our clients are very used to doing things manually, and there's an education process. Can, can machines actually do this? How can a machine look at a 100-page trust document and extract 
the list of, of uh, uh, beneficial owners, their dates of birth, their residences, when, that, the, when those data could be anywhere in the document. They could be on the last page, could be on the first page. The, the, the way they're, they're, they're expressed could be different. How can, how, can that actually be done? Can we really execute know your customer policies? Well, in this case, this proof of concept, uh, this, this first column, which is actual time, we did a time and motion study, and on average, for this type of client, medium risk uh, commercial client, it, they, were, they were spending 13 hours and change doing this, this function of document review, check due diligence, etc. And with the platform, it was, it, was, it was fairly young when we started this, out of the box, we got more than 75% time reduction. And most of that time reduction is people no longer having to read documents, the machine can do that. People no longer having to apply policies, the machine can do that. Um, and the remaining time, so on average, uh, three hours and change. Now, that three hours and change, this is not like a gradual um, uplift in everybody's productivity. What, what tends to happen is the, if the exception rate, in other words, when, when something really needs attention, you want to flag that to a human operator. And that human operator is saved some effort because the file is created automatically, but you're still spending a lot of the same amount of time on those files. But where there are no exceptions and the machine is very comfortable that it's gotten the information it needs and it's applied the policies, it becomes straight through. And uh, when, we, uh, when, we have, uh, when we have done this, uh, everybody, everybody is, of course, because this function is so important, how reliable is the technology? How good is your scan rate? How, 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 you know, how are you detecting errors? We have to answer all those questions. Everyone wants to know that. Uh, I have yet to see a case where an operation center full of $11 an hour file clerks has outperformed the machine. The machine's better every time. And uh, uh, we have one client where you know, they had 125 people doing this in Manila. And with this type of benefit, they said, well, we, we can actually move that function to Jersey City. If all we're going to be left with is 10 or 20 people, why put up with, why, why take the frictional cost of having an offshore labor force? So when, when I say the real benefits lie elsewhere, everyone is interested in productivity. No one wants to hire tons and tons of people to do this. No one wants to run these big operational centers. Maybe some people do, but a lot of people don't. But the real benefit is that a bank that has automated this using digital labor now has a, a very consistent process. The same rules applied all the time. There's no, there's no uh, difference in performance between individuals. There's no, um, uh, uh, there's no training uh, cycle where a person is less productive. And from, a, um, from an audit trail perspective, because we keep every interaction, every document, all the metadata. If whenever, when, when a client is audited, we can show for this client, the regulator could come and say, look, Michael Henry, he was found to be uh, you know, funneling money to Cuba. Uh, bank, tell me how you perform due diligence on Michael Henry. And the regulator, actually the bank is not responsible for my laundry, not laundering, but sending money to Cuba or in violating sanctions. The bank's not responsible for that. What the bank is responsible for is showing the regulator that I have, have, have a legitimate policy of performing due diligence on Michael. I collected the right information. I, I did all the reasonable steps, check, 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 check. And therefore, it was reasonable for me to, to onboard Michael Henry and allow him to, to, to do business with the bank. And very hard to do that if the function is people turning over papers or looking on screens and just kind of checking a box at the end that he's approved. And in fact, the, the bank I talked about where they lost their ability to, to clear US dollars for a year, it was because they were unable to show the process they used to identify and perform due diligence on the client. We had a, um, we've, we, uh, since um, we, we continue to, uh, to, to take the solution to market, this is a, 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 a case study. We have a global commercial bank, the one where we did the proof of concept from the previous slide. They have 3,500 people in an offshore center doing this work, reading documents, transcribing, liberating data from their data gulags, applying policies, determining risk levels, performing due diligence. 
and 3,500 people. And uh, I don't think it's on here, but they, they, uh, they, they claim they have an attrition rate of 10% per month. So every month, just to keep the staff at a current level there, they have to hire 350 people. Can you imagine the training cost, the, the, the productivity hit, and the risk? Because as I said, the future of the bank is now resting upon this clerk that we hired in February, and we hope he, he learned the training course. The, in, to make matters worse, that, that was just to keep up with regular uh, ongoing operations, their regulator, uh, they issued what's called a consent order. And they said, you know, there's a group of customers we're very concerned about, you need to repaper them. Which means, already customers of the bank, they've already been onboarded at some point, this function's already been done, you need to remediate, you need to repaper 400,000 of these clients, because we're concerned. And uh, I had a, um, a banking client explain to me that the regulator is kind of like your mother-in-law. You know, you, she's welcome to come to your house, but kind of a pain in the ass to have around and, and give you advice. So the bank estimated they had to, in order to comply, they had to hire an additional 1,000 to 1,500 people and it would probably cost them about $500 a client to do this. And so it was a great uh, case for us to say, well, instead of doing that, okay, why don't we look at an automated solution? And we recently converted them. Uh, and so they've avoided hiring 1,000 staff. Uh, every test, every comparison shows higher accuracy and consistency and a large reduction in the cost per client. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it was, uh, it was, it was we, were, we were very happy to have our first big global at scale implementation uh, on the solution. And uh, I'll explain a little bit later how Mark Logic helped us. Um, another uh, use case, uh, tax classification, I'm sure everyone's riveted by this one. But in general, uh, just to sum it up, the IRS requires every bank in the world to determine whether or not their clients are subject to withholding according to IRS rules. And there are certain, there's a certain status that you have that make you a U.S. resident for tax purposes. So uh, if, you are, if you are a U.S. citizen, which I, which I am, for example. You fell out of W-9, I'm an American, American citizen, I reside in the United States, that's fine. The bank just has to record that they receive the W-9 and they withhold me as an American. If, let's say you are a resident of the UK, which has treaty benefits with the United States, and you say, I, you, so th therefore you don't have to withhold from me. Uh, it's about an eight page form called a W-8 Benny you need to fill out, very complex form. That form has to be ingested, and you know, e-forms, for the most part, have solved that problem. I always encourage my clients to move to e-forms. But what the bank has to do with a W-8, you're claiming that you are not a U.S. resident for tax purposes and therefore not subject to withholding. What the bank has to do is they have to perform due diligence on you. Are you lying? Are you just trying to get out of withholding? And the way they do that is they have to review your know your customer documentation and they look for what are called U.S. indicia. Is there, do you have a registered business address in the United States? Do you have a U.S. phone number? Is there, there, there's, a, there's a list of things that, that, you, that, uh, that you have to check. And if, if, of course, if the check comes up with something suspicious, then you have to uh, do uh, more investigation. But of course, most of the time, there are no exceptions. But a human being, to process a W-8 Benny, a good, a skilled human being probably spends an hour to an hour and a half ingesting that form, performing that due diligence. If I can read the information, or I already have the data, then uh, using our platform, we can do 10 to 12 of these an hour. Once again, you're really just focusing time on exceptions. And for processes like these, the fewer exceptions you have, the greater the productivity benefits because the more straight through processing you have. Uh, I just want to, one more point on this. Um, uh, and that's another example of what the real benefit is. Productivity is great, but our FATCA engine, you know, we have, we have people whose job it is to stay on top of IRS regulations. We apply more than 6,000 different validation and due diligence rules. There's no human being in the world who can apply that comprehensive set of rules as consistently as the machine can. I love human beings. I love all of you. But there's certain things that we're really good at. This is not one of them. And you know, if, if the exception rate is low, and your job is to go through and check this stuff, 
And let's say your quota for the day, I don't know, is, is 12 or 15 of these that you have to do in your operations center. And you've, you know, for the last three days, you've been doing this, you've been hitting your quota, you haven't found any exceptions. For some reason, you fell behind today. You've got three left to do, and you've got to go pick up your kid in 15 minutes. You haven't found an exception in a long time. What's the, what's the, most, logic, what's the most natural thing for a human being to do? Likely, you're not going to find anything. Machines will never do that. Uh, I want to talk about regulatory reporting. Uh, large financial institutions have to uh, comply with a set of uh, um, Federal Reserve regulations that test their balance sheet and stress their balance sheet for certain adverse economic effects. And, the, and so the bank will, you know, will, will produce those statements, and that's, that's a painful process. But what the, when they're audited, what the bank will have to do is they'll, the, the Fed will ask them, explain to me this value. Where does it come from? I want to know all the way back to the point the information was collected where, where, where this value came from. And so uh, in, in this case, it was a large bank. They, had, um, they were hiring people, 300 contractors. It took them 18 months to go through one portfolio. <clears throat> They're reading a lot of loan documents, commercial real estate loan documents, and extracting values and then comparing them to what was in the systems. And once again, uh, the, the, the machines are so good that we could take their data cesspool of documents. And there, there, there were no metadata on these files. These are all documents like, you know, abc.pdf. There's nothing to identify. And we're able to put together, by reading and interpreting the documents, a structure which, uh, from the left to right, a, a, a portfolio has, the, has these clients. A client has these loans. A loan has events in its life cycle from origination, modification, uh, to, to closure, and w w each, of those, each of those events has a set of documents, and each of those documents has, has data. And we were able to, uh, fairly unaided, put together from the data cesspool a data structure like this that allowed the bank to compare, are the, this is, or, or to show the, the lineage of the data. <clears throat> All right, so our platform, I'm going to speed up a little bit here. Mark logic is at the core, and I hope, that, uh, I hope it's fairly obvious from the way I've described the problem and how we solve it, and from the things we've heard at the conference, why it's at the core. Mark logic is where all the magic happens. We have an, another tool where we maintain policies. So banks will have specific KYC, due diligence policies. We maintain them there. Our content enrichment framework, our friends uh, from Smart Logic are also here. They're a natural language processor. They help us extract data uh, from unstructured forms. And at runtime, we will then take the policies and the data, uh, make the evaluations, uh, handle exceptions, et cetera. There are other parts of the solution, but in general, that's the, that's, that's the key. That's where all the magic happens. Now, uh, Mark Logic, why, why are we really happy with Mark Logic? First, boy, I tell you, if we had to model different schema every time we got a new document type or um, uh, a change in a, in a client system, we would do nothing else. And I think this is one of the barriers that's, that pre prevents, or prevents our clients from developing similar capabilities. It's just the, the ease of integration of data. Uh, we, we knew that from the beginning. We wanted uh, a multi-model database. Thanks. Um, and you know, and of course, using the semantic triples to store the data, we can we can define. You know, data tend to occur on multiple documents. Some documents are primary, some are secondary. Those relationships are quite important and easy to define in Mark Logic. Um, the, uh, uh, in the middle here, for our uh, uh, big whale client that we've just converted, you know, they, uh, we've, we've scaled to handling more than 400,000 documents an hour. They have more than 50 million data we're collecting from 8 million documents. We have pushed it, and we know where our breakpoints are. We know how, how much volume we can handle, and we know where it's going to break. We have yet to find a break, a break point in Mark Logic. So that's, that's, that's pretty good, since that's, since that's our, the core of our platform. Uh, uh, that, this, big, this big client as well, it's our first cloud implementation of the platform. Very, very, uh, very happy to do that. That was the bank's decision. It's always the bank's decision. Uh, and uh, Mark Logic was also very helpful um, because they've deployed in, in different cloud infrastructures. That they've been a great business partner, uh, and uh, we use their professional services a lot. We are very excited on the right side. A lot of the data that we're talking about here are confidential. 
and are, um, they, sometimes they don't even belong to the bank. So we, we're looking carefully, and I think there's a great opportunity in some of the security, the redaction, the element level security things we've been seeing in, in MarkLogic 9. All right, uh, I'll, I'll skip these with just a couple of operational screenshots. So here's an unstructured document. We, we run policies on it, and I'll skip that for a second. So our digital labor platform uses a, a number of capabilities to automate what is traditionally a very manual process. It's faster, more effective, more accurate, certainly cheaper, scalable, and looking into the future, the technology is only getting better. Uh, this, is, this is where, this is where uh, compliance functions are going. So I will be around. Uh, my friend uh, Brian from KPMG is also around uh, for lunch or afterwards uh, in the conference. Love to answer any questions about it. We're, we're quite happy. With, uh, with what we've done in our relationship with MarkLogic. Thank you very much for having me here today.